Hello students, welcome to EPG Partshala. I am Dr. Aranya Bhattacharji from the School of Physical Sciences, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. Today, we are going to discuss about the module Antiferromagnetic Heisenberg Model from the paper Solid State Physics. So, students, let us see what we are going to learn in this module. Learn to calculate the ground state of the antiferromagnetic Heisenberg model. Learn what are nil state. Learn to diagonalize the antiferromagnetic Heisenberg model. Learn to calculate the energy of a magnon. Now we consider the isotropic nearest neighbor antiferromagnetic Heisenberg model in which the coupling J is less than 0. Under such condition, the neighboring spins tend to be anti parallel. Okay, so this is the antiferromagnetism that neighboring spins are anti parallel. The main difference between the ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic cases becomes very clear when we try to minimize the ground state of a bond. So the energy of this state Eij is equal to J into vector Si dot vector Sj, which is equal to minus J into S into S plus 1 plus J by 2 into S vector Si plus vector Sj whole square. Now, if the spins are singlet, then Eij is smallest when the sum Si vector Si plus vector Sj is equal to 0. Under that circumstances, the energy Ei, the minimum energy of Eij will be equal to simply minus J S into S plus 1. So, what is the meaning of this minimum energy? Minimum energy does not simply mean that the two spins point in opposite directions. Okay. That is Sij is equal to S and S i z can be minus z, s no this would only give us energy as minus j s raised to power z the true ground state is obtained by allowing z component of the spin to fluctuate so that the system can gain energy also from the spin flip terms Now look at this figure, you know, meaning of this energy, minimum energy is very clear from here and this is basically the nil state. So you see here, this is a typically what we describe in the antiferromagnetic case, the nearest neighbor spins have opposite directions, the up spin, down spin, then again up, then again down, both in, in the vertical and the horizontal sense. This is basically a nil state. Okay, students, so we will begin this discussion again about nil states what exactly are the nil states so this is basically you know required to understand the spin waves in antiferromagnets okay so in the previous slide we had already given you a figure describing the nil state and what exactly was it that the tendency of neighboring spins to point in opposite directions is called a nil state Neighboring spin means basically if you have, let's say you consider a you know a linear lattice, a simple linear lattice. So if in the lattice side one you have a spin which is pointing up, in the lattice side two it will be down, in the lattice side three it will be up, lattice side it will be four, and so on. So this is a simple case that we I have just said about a linear lattice. But if you have a two-dimensional lattice, then the same thing is valid both direction oh, right so as you, i mean like you can say that i mean like in the first side if you have got one if you're going towards the right then you have on the second side you have down spin in the similar manner if you go up along the first side it will be down okay so uh, you can consider in the let's say x y direction the x direction is also a linear y direction is linear but again all the uh, neighboring spins have opposite directions so in order to describe such a situation of the nil state the best thing that would be that we divide the entire lattice into two interpenetrating sub lattices A and B. Okay, so it's like this that you know you have two lattices A and B, 
and each of this lattice has got these spins pointing in one direction okay so if you have in the a lattice all the spins are pointing up and in the b lattice you have all the spin pointing down and then you merge them together then you exactly get an eight state where each neighboring has got opposite spins the spins on a and b point opposite to each other that is say in a and b point opposite to each other that is a all spins point up then in b all spins point down now what we do is next that having sort of described the nil states in terms of two interpenetrating sub lattices a and b we now rotate all spin operators on the b sub lattice by 180 degree about the x axis and why do we do this uh, simply that you know uh, it makes the mathematics simpler so when you do that this means that x goes to x y goes to minus y and z goes to minus z and the spin operators transform as sj plus goes to sj plus sj minus sj minus goes to sj plus sjz goes to minus of sjz sjy goes to minus of sjy and nothing happens to the x component that is sjx remains plus sjx we next consider only nearest neighbor interactions and write the heisenberg hamiltonian as follows that is h is equal to 2 times mod of j summation over ij where ij are nearest neighbors multiplied by half summation over in the square brackets that you have si plus into sj plus plus si negative into sj negative minus sij into sjz now as before adopting the schwinger representation of quantum spins we rewrite the above hamiltonian as the following so what was the schwinger representation remember the schwinger representation was that we rewrite all the spin operators in terms of the bosonic operators a's so what you have to do is that you have to sort of go back take into account all the spins operators as sx xy sz which are written in terms of these a's bosonic operators a and put them into this hamiltonian and the result you get is this very long equation of describing the heisenberg hamiltonian now again using the semi classical approximation and taking s to be very large so in this limit then a i can be written as which is something which you have already done before is equal to under root of s bi plus ai minus under root of s into bi so repeating that what we had done here is that we have added under root of s into bi and subtracted under root of s bi nothing changes but yes this is some kind of a transformation that we are doing in order to simplify the hamiltonian now again as usual as before in the previous module as we did taking all the b's as usual constant that is b i is equal to b or if b j is equal to b assuming b to be uniform in space the leading term in the hamiltonian becomes h approximately equal to this minus n z mod of j s square in the square brackets you have 1 minus b square whole square minus b square into 2 minus b square now if b equal to 0 you will get minus n z mod of j s square for b equal to 0 you have got this very simple result the continuing further when trying to describe the spin waves in antiferromagnets we now expand next to quadratic order in ai dagger n ai this is something which you are already familiar with you have done that before so h is approximately equal to into mod of j summation over the nearest neighbors ij in the square brackets you have got minus s square plus s into these quadratic terms quadratic in these a's again as before in order to diagonalize the hamiltonian we use the following that is ak is equal to 1 by root n summation over iota e raised to power ik dot ri into ai and rewrite above hamiltonian in terms of ak dagger and ak as below so that is h is equal to minus mod of j nz s square plus mod of j into s 
summation over k and vector k and vector delta where this vector delta is r i vector r i minus vector r j remember j is equal to iota plus minus j are the nearest neighbor vectors and uh, the Hamiltonian that I've, we have just seen here contains a term cos k dot delta well i mean you see in the previous uh, module uh, this uh, expression for ak that we had used had given us you know a very nice result i mean that we it was able to diagonalize the hamiltonian now, the problem is that after using this specific hamiltonian we see that we still haven't been able to diagonalize this hamiltonian it's not diagonal so what we have to do is that we have to make a new transformation and this new transformation ak is equal to cos hyperbolic alpha k into r k plus sine hyperbolic alpha k into r of minus k. So there is k in the positive direction minus k in the negative direction. So the transformation that I had mentioned in the previous slide, I use that transformation to write down certain quantities which appear in the Hamiltonian. Okay. So explicitly actually I have shown this here. So that is a k dagger into a k a minus k dagger. How what form it will have uh, by using the new transformation that I had described is given here. In a similar manner, the expression for a k into a minus k a k into a k that is with the same k vector is also given here. You will notice that all this actually they contain the hyperbolic functions of cos and sine. They look all these things looks very complicated, but the good thing is that if you sort of put them in into the Hamiltonian and collect these terms together and try to use your basic knowledge about trigonometry, you will see that things really simplify a lot. Actually. So that is exactly the main aim would be in the next slide to sort of collecting all the cross terms. Okay, so this is very important. I mean, you have to be very now uh, careful in what we are going to do next in order to diagonalize. Okay, there will be certain constraints we have to put in order to diagonalize and this is a standard procedure that we will be following in order to do that. So again continuing as I said collecting all the terms call the cross terms we get the following equation. So the following equation you will see contains a uh, lot many things and at the same time uh, I just want to mention before I proceed that the ch is nothing but cos hyperbolic of alpha k and this sh is sine hyperbolic of alpha k. I have used this short form because otherwise uh, this uh, equation would you know like uh, would be really very long. So just to sort of you know like make it look nice, uh, use this short form. Now, uh, so this the first equation that is mentioned here is uh, simplified a little bit, and then it we come down to the second equation actually. Now what we get here is that after simplifying and doing some trivial uh, manipulation we get a constraint because you see that in a hamiltonian if we want to diagonalize then the cross terms should vanish right diagonalize means that there are only diagonal elements of diagonal elements the cross terms do not exist so that basically means that the sum total of these cross terms should be equal to zero this is exactly what is written in this equations the first two equations they have to be zero but then to make uh, these terms zero that is the sum total there is a constraint which comes in which is basically derived from this this equation itself and the constraint is that hyperbolic tan of 2 alpha k is equal to minus 1 by z summation over the delta vector cos of k dot delta so if the tan hyperbolic 2 alpha k is equal to this term on the right hand side then the above equations is satisfied that is the cross terms of the off diagonal terms become zero this is a constraint so finally putting the constraint the hamiltonian in terms of the operator r becomes h is equal to minus mod of j and z s into s plus 1 plus 2 mod of j s summation over k r k dagger r k plus half under root of 1 minus tan hyperbolic 2 alpha k so we get the energy of a magnon with the wave vector k s the following that is ek is equal to this expression that you see here so the to the lowest order that is you know like uh, 
if you try to expand or low k small k it is directly proportional to k the ek is directly proportional to k the approximation magnon dispersion relation so this is a dispersion relation it compares very well with expand so you see that basically means that the holstein primakov transformation that we did earlier and all this methodology that we have adopted it is a successful attempt to understand the theory and that the theoretically calculated dispersion compares well with experiment so students in this module we have studied about the ground state of anti ferromagnetic heisenberg model that can be calculated by allowing the z components of the spin to fluctuate the anti ferromagnetic heisenberg model can be solved by assuming the existence of two interpenetrating sub lattices okay the model can also be solved using the schwinger representation of quantum spins for small k the wave vector k the magnon dispersion relation is linear in k so thanks for visiting e part chala